Hello, my amazing children. This is Grandma Carla, and I want to bring you a very special, very fun book. That is Pippi Longstocking, and Pippi Longstocking has been around a while, kind of like Grandma Carla. Um, Pippi Longstocking was written by Astrid Lindgren, and the um, original book was written uh, back in, hmm, trying to look for the original, first published in 1950. That was before Grandma Carla was born. So it's been around a while, just like Grandma Carla's been around a really long time. But I love um, the books by Astrid Lundgren. I love Pippi Longstocking, and we're going to enjoy this together. I hope that you will enjoy it as much as I will have fun reading it. So I'm in my college classroom. So if my voice echoes a little bit, sorry about that. It's because this is where I happen to have a few minutes to read a chapter. So here we go. Pippi Longstocking by Astrid Lindgren, Chapter One. Pippi moves into Villa Villacula. All right, so I'm going to go back and show you all the pictures at the end of the chapter, okay? Pippi moves into Villa Villacula. Way out at the end of a tiny little town was an old overgrown garden, and in the garden was an old house, and in the house lived Pippi Longstocking. She was nine years old, and she lived there all alone. She had no mother and no father, and that was, of course, very nice because there was no one to tell her to go to bed just when she was having the most fun, and no one who could make her take cod liver oil when she much preferred caramel candy. Once upon a time, Pippi had had a father of whom she was extremely proud. Naturally, she had had a mother, too, but that was so long ago that Pippi did not remember her at all. Her mother had died when Pippi was just a tiny baby and lay in a cradle and howled so that nobody could go anywhere near her. Pippi was sure that her mother was now up in heaven, watching her little girl through a peephole in the sky. And Pippi often waved up at her and called, Don't you worry about me. I'll always come out on top. Pippi had not forgotten her father. He was a sea captain who sailed on the great ocean, and Pippi had sailed with him in his ship until one day. Her father had blown overboard in a storm and disappeared. But Pippi was absolutely certain that he would come back. She would never believe that he had drowned. She was sure that he had floated until he had landed on an island inhabited by cannibals. And she thought that he had become the king of all the cannibals and went around with a golden crown on his head all day long. My papa is a cannibal king. It certainly isn't every child who has such a stylish papa. Pippi used to say with satisfaction, and as soon as my papa has built himself a boat, he will come and get me, and I'll be a cannibal princess. Hi-ho, won't that be exciting? Her father had bought the old house in the garden many, many years ago. He thought he would live there with Pippi when he grew old and couldn't sail the seas any longer. And then this annoying thing had to happen that he was blown into the ocean. And while Pippi was waiting for him to come back, she went straight home to Villa Villacula. That was the name of the house. It stood there ready and waiting for her. One lovely summer evening, she had said goodbye to all of the sailors on her father's boat. They were all fond of Pippi. And she said to them, so long, boys, she said, and she kissed each one on the forehead. Don't you worry about me. I'll always come out on top. Two things she took with her from the ship. A little monkey whose name was Mr. Nielsen. He was a present from her father and a big suitcase full of gold pieces. Ooh. The sailors stood upon the deck and watched as long as they could see her. She walked straight ahead without looking back at all with Mr. Nielsen on her shoulder and her suitcase in her hand. 
A remarkable child, said one of the sailors, as Pippi disappeared into the distance. Well, he was right. Pippi was indeed a remarkable child. The most remarkable thing about her was that she was so strong. She was so very strong that in the whole wide world, there was not a single police officer as strong as she. Why, she could lift a whole horse if she wanted to. And she wanted to. She had a horse of her own that she had bought with her many gold pieces, just one of her many gold pieces, the day that she came home to Villa, Villa Kula. She had always longed for a horse, and now here he was, living on her porch. When Pippi wanted to drink her afternoon coffee there, she simply lifted him down into the garden. Beside Villa, Villa Kula, was another garden and another house. In that house lived a father and a mother with two charming children, a boy and a girl. The boy's name was Tommy, and the girl's name was Annika. They were good, well brought up, and obedient children. Tommy would never think of biting his nails, and he always did exactly what his mother told him to do. Annika never fussed when she didn't get her own way, and she always looked pretty in her little well-ironed cotton dresses. She took the greatest care not to get them dirty. Tommy and Annika played nicely with each other in their garden, but they often wished for a playmate. While Pippi was still sailing on the ocean with her father, they often used to hang over the fence and say to each other, isn't it silly that nobody ever moves into that house? Somebody ought to live there, somebody with children. On that lovely summer, when Pippi for the first time stepped over the threshold of Villa, Villa Kula, Tommy and Annika were, Annika were not at home. They had gone to visit their grandmother for a week, and so they had no idea that anybody had moved into the house next door. On the first day after they came again, they stood by the gate, looking out onto the street, and even then, they didn't know that there was actually a playmate so near. Just as they were standing there considering what they should do and wondering whether anything exciting was likely to happen or whether it was going to be one of those dull days when they couldn't think of anything to play, just then the gate of Villa Villa Kula opened and a little girl stepped out. She was the most remarkable girl Tommy and Annika had ever seen. She was Miss Pippi Longstocking out for her morning promenade. This is the way she looked. Her hair, the color of a carrot, was braided in two tight braids that stuck straight out. Her nose was the shape of a very small potato and was dotted all over with freckles. It must be admitted that the mouth under this nose was a very wide one with strong white teeth. Her dress was rather unusual. Pippi herself had made it. She had meant for it to be blue, but there wasn't quite enough blue cloth, so Pippi had sewed little red pieces on it here and there. On her long, thin legs, she wore a pair of long stockings, one brown and one black and she had a pair of black shoes that were exactly twice as long as her feet. These shoes her father had bought for her in South America so that Pippi would have something to grow into, and she never wanted to wear any others. But the thing that made Tommy and Annika open their eyes widest of all was the monkey sitting on the strange girl's shoulder. It was a little monkey dressed in blue pants yellow jacket and a white straw hat. Pippi walked along the street with one foot on the sidewalk and the other in the gutter. Tommy and Annika watched as long as they could see her. In a little while she came back and now she was walking backward. That was because she didn't want to turn around to get home. When she reached Tommy's and Annika's gate she stopped. The children looked at each other in silence. At last Tommy spoke. Why did you walk backward? Why did I walk backward? asked Pippi. Isn't this a free country? Can't a person walk any way she wants to? For that matter, let me tell you that in Egypt everyone walks that way and nobody thinks it the least bit strange. Strange. How do you 
no, asked Tommy. You've never been to Egypt, have you? I've never been to Egypt? Indeed I have. That's one thing you can be sure of. I've been all over the world and seen many things stranger than people walking backward. I wonder what you would say if I had come along walking on my hands the way they do in farthest India. Now you must be lying, said Tommy. Pippi thought for a moment. You're right, she said sadly. I am lying. It's wicked to lie, said Annika, who had just at last gathered up courage to speak. Yes, it's very wicked to lie, said Pippi even more sadly. But I forget it now and then. And how can you expect a little child whose mother is an angel and whose father is king of a cannibal island and who herself has sailed on the ocean all of her life, how can you expect her to always tell the truth? And for that matter, she continued, her whole freckled face lighting up, let me tell you that in the Congo, there is not a single person who tells the truth. They lie all day long, begin at seven in the morning and keep it up until sundown. So if I should happen to lie now and then, you must try to excuse me and to remember that it's only because I stayed in the Congo a little too long. We can be friends anyway, can't we? Oh, sure, said Tommy, and he realized suddenly that this was not going to be one of those dull days. By the way, why couldn't you come and have breakfast with me, asked Pippi. Why not, said Tommy. Come on, let's go. Oh, yes, let's, said Annika. But first, I must introduce you to Mr. Nielsen, said Pippi, and the little monkey took off his cap and bowed politely. Then they all went in through Villa Villacula's tumble-down garden gate along the gravel path bordered with old moss-covered trees and really good climbing trees they seemed to be up to the house and onto the porch. There stood the horse munching oats out of a soup bowl. Why do you have a horse on your porch? asked Tommy. All horses that he knew lived in stables. Well, said Pippi thoughtfully, he'd be in the way in the kitchen and he does not like the parlor. Tommy and Annika patted the horse and then went on into the house. It had a kitchen, a parlor, and a bedroom, but it certainly looked as if Pippi had forgotten to do her Friday cleaning that week. Tommy and Annika looked around cautiously, just in case the king of the cannibal isles might be sitting in a corner somewhere. They had never seen a cannibal king in all of their lives, but there was no father to be seen nor any mother either. Annika said anxiously, Do you here, live here all alone? Of course not, said Pippi. Mr. Nielsen and the horse live here too. <clears throat> yes, but I mean, don't you have any father or mother here? No, not the least little tiny bit of a one, said Pippi happily. But who tells you when to go to bed at night and things like that, asked Annika. I tell myself, said Pippi. First, I tell myself in a nice, friendly way. And then, if I don't mind, I tell myself again more sharply. And if I still don't mind, then I'm in for a spanking, see? Tommy and Annika did not see at all, but they thought maybe it was a good way. Meanwhile, they had come out of the kitchen and Pippi cried, Now we're going to make a pancake. Now we're going to be a pan -key. Now we're going to fry a pan -kai. Then she took three eggs and threw them up in the air. One fell down on her head and broke so that the yolk ran into her eyes. But the other she caught skillfully in a bowl where they smashed to pieces. I always did hear that egg yolk was very good for the hair, said Pippi, wiping her eyes. You wait and see. Mine will soon begin to grow so fast that it will crackle. As a matter of fact, in Brazil, all of the people go about with eggs on their hair, and there are no bald-headed people. Only once was there a man who was so foolish that he ate his eggs instead of rubbing them in his hair. He became completely bald, and when he showed himself on the street, there was such a riot that the police were called out. While she was speaking, Pippi had neatly picked the eggshells out of the bowl with her fingers. Now she took a bath brush that hung on the wall and began to beat the pancake batter so hard that it splashed all over the walls. At last, she poured what was left onto a griddle that stood on the stove. 
When the pancake was brown on one side, she tossed it halfway up to the ceiling so that it turned right around in the air, and then she caught it in the griddle again. And when it was ready, she threw it straight across the kitchen, right onto a plate that stood on the table. Eat, she cried, eat before it gets cold. And Tommy and Annika ate, and they thought it a very good pancake. Afterward, Pippi invited them to step into the parlor. There was only one piece of furniture in there. It was a huge chest with many tiny drawers. Pippi opened the drawers and showed Tommy and Annika all of the treasures that she kept there. There were wonderful bird's eggs, strange shells and stones, pretty little boxes, lovely silver mirrors, pearl necklaces, and many other things that Pippi and her father had brought, bought on their journeys around the world. Pippi gave each of her new playmates a little gift to remember her by. Tommy got a dagger with a shimmering mother of pearl handle and Annika a little box with a cover decorated in pink shells. In the box, there was a ring with a green stone. Suppose you go home now, said Pippi, so that you can come back again tomorrow. Because if you don't go home, then you can't come back and that would be a shame. Tommy and Annika agreed that it would indeed, and so they went home, past the horse, who had now eaten up all of the oats, and out through the gate of Villa Villacula. Mr. Nielsen waved his hat at them as they left. And that is the end of chapter one. So let's look at the little pictures. There's not a lot of pictures in here, but we'll look at a few of them. All right, now, right here, do you see that Pippi is making her pancake batter and splashing it everywhere. Look at her at the floor where she has splashed all over the floor. And then a little bit bigger picture, a little easier to see. There is Miss Pippi with all of her messy kitchen flipping her pancakes there. So there's her pancake that went up into the air. Let's see if we can get See the path of the pancake up there? And she's got all kinds of splatters on the wall because she's not very careful. Okay, so, and that is the last of the pictures of chapter one. And I hope that you are enjoying Pippi Longstocking as much as I am enjoying reading it to you. This is Grandma Carla, and I love you.